say a quick hello, uh, and then I'll turn the floor to Mark to give a proper introduction. Uh, I know most everyone in the room, but those that I don't, my name is Dan Tygard. I, I helped to organize the Values Institute speaker series with the philosophy department, and in conjunction with the Humanity Center, we're very pleased to be welcoming Emily Brady to campus here. Uh, so just a very brief thank you to everyone who has helped to organize the Values Institute series. Uh, Mike Kelly and Darby Vickers have been instrumental in that, and we would be nowhere without Leanna here uh, and uh, Lindy as well. Big thanks to Brian for the space and hospitality as always. Uh, and I'll turn the floor to Mark to give a proper introduction of uh, <laughs> Professor Brady. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Emily Brady. Uh, she is a professor of philosophy at Texas A&M. Prior to that, she was a professor of environment and philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. She is the, her latest book, she's co-author with Isis Brook and Jonathan Pryor of Between Nature and Culture, the Aesthetics of Modified Environments. And I think you're gonna be speaking about modified environments today. 2018, she's also the author of The Sublime and Moral Philosophy, Aesthetics, Ethics and Nature, 2013. She's also the author of Aesthetics of the Natural Environment in 2003. She's the co-editor with Pauline Bemister, am I pronouncing her mm -hmm. right? Okay, of Human Environment Relations, Transformative Values and Theory and Practice in 2021. She's also the co-editor with Gerald Levinson of Aesthetic Concepts, Essays after Sibley, 2001. Her research interests include aesthetics and philosophy of art, environmental aesthetics, environmental ethics, 18th century philosophy, and animal studies. Uh, environmental aesthetics has increasingly been concerned with exploring how humans engage aesthetically with forms of human modified and human influenced nature. And today we're going to hear about that. So uh, I welcome Emily Brady. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you to the Values Institute and the Humanities Center. It's um, really exciting to be here, and also um, uh, uh, really interesting to see the, the initiative here, the three-year initiative on landscapes and human meaning. So I hope this talk also contributes something um, uh, to that series. Uh, so um, this talk is, uh, it grew out of an invitation. Um, uh, we all get many different kinds of invitations, I think, as academics, but um, this one was really intriguing because it was from some planners actually in the UK, at, in Newcastle and at UCL. And they were um, uh, doing a book called Post-Capitalist Countrysides. And so for me, it was an interesting opportunity not, not only to, to engage with some planners, but also to to start thinking more about the social and political side of environmental aesthetics, uh, of which at least in, in, in analytic aesthetics and in kind of my crowd, as it were, of people writing and uh, presenting, um, has not really been addressed all that much. So, so it is fairly new work for me. Um, the talk is based on a chapter that's forthcoming in the book. Uh, I think it'll come out later in 2024 called Post-Capitalist Countrysides. Uh, and I think it's supposed to be uh, open access from UCL Press. So uh, my talk is going to um, develop the idea of post-capitalist aesthetics and show how creative interventions function to support forms of commoning and resistance. I'd, I'd like to emphasize um, that the context of my discussion is rural. So first of all, it was uh, the talk is uh, again based on a chapter for this book that focuses on um, post-capitalist countrysides, um, but also uh, the topic reflects a long-standing interest I have in land and ecological art, uh, as well as of course in environmental aesthetics, but specifically in relation to semi-natural places uh, or environments or landscapes, <clears throat> which the 2018 book addressed with my two co-authors. So I'll be using the slides really just uh, for outline and overview, and then also for showing you some image of the artworks that I'll be discussing. So an overview of the talk, I'm going to provide a theoretical foundation in the first part, um, and there I'll outline post-capitalist aesthetics by bringing a relational and pluralistic environmental aesthetics into conversation with various concepts, such as place, uh, post-pastoral, socio-natures, and commoning. 
In the second part, I'm going to use this approach to explore case studies from land art or, uh, for those of you not familiar, artworks which take place outside of gallery or museum settings and often engage with ecological practices. Uh, and um, I'll then turn to a particular uh, discussion of artworks, uh, three different artists or art practices, uh, Patricia Johansson, Collins on Goto Studio, and um, Jorge Mena Barreto. And I'll show how some art practices support human ecological relationships of care and resistance. And taking direction from Mena Barreto's work, the conclusion will scale up post-capitalist aesthetics through uh, the concept of planetary commoning, not my own concept, uh, and the more expansive context of intergenerational and geopolitical concerns. I'm going to take a conceptual and very interdisciplinary uh, methodological approach. I'll be drawing on ideas from aesthetics, from environmental philosophy, and also from critical human geography. So an overview uh, and the topics I'll be working through uh, for the section on post-capitalist aesthetics. Post-capitalist aesthetics serves as an alternative to and a critique of capitalist aesthetics insofar as it embodies a pluralistic and relational rather than elitist and individualist aesthetics. It's situated within a broader framework of critical aesthetic pluralism. This pluralism operates at various levels of experience and is theorized as multisensory, immersive, affective, imaginative, relational, and participatory. Within a rural context, post-capitalist aesthetics is post-pastoral and place-based, and interprets relationality through the value space of interdependent, meaningful relations, rather than isolated subjects or valuers. Let me explain further, starting with the broad framework of this approach. So I'm gonna start by talking about how I conceive of aesthetics as relational and pluralistic. What is relational and pluralistic aesthetic theory? I've argued elsewhere that aesthetic experience and the meanings and values which flow from it are relational in some fundamental ways. So I'm gonna summarize uh, what I've argued about um, this uh, pluralistic aesthetic theory elsewhere. Here are some of the key points. Uh, first, I argue that um, uh, the aesthetic subject or community is situated aesthetically through a variety of relations, beginning with perceptual relations. As I see it, aesthetic qualities are response dependent and emerge from a perceptual relationship between the subject and world. That relationship can also be multisensory and multilayered as emotional, imaginative, and knowledge-based engagement become active. Secondly, sensitive relations. So, being open and receptive to the world, as I see it, grounds sensitive attention, which enables the discovery of aesthetic qualities and creates opportunities for interaction and participation. And then, meaningful relations. I argue that aesthetic experiences give rise to a plurality of values rather than the common association, at least historically, of aesthetic, uh, of aesthetic value only with pleasure. Both positive and negative interactions give meaning and value to human lives. And finally, temporal relations. Aesthetic experiences occur in both space and time. Temporality is captured through the, uh, through the evolution of aesthetic relations as both appreciators and aesthetic phenomena interact and change over time. In the environmental context, prominent causes of change to aesthetic phenomena are biophysical processes, atmospheric conditions, and seasons. So this list of relations is not intended to be exhaustive, uh, and these, rela these relations share features with other aesthetic theories, especially those found in the areas of everyday and environmental aesthetics. I'm thinking here of recent work by Yuriko Saito on the aesthetics of care. Aesthetic relations can be shallow or deep, depending upon the effort of the subject and the extent to which aesthetic phenomena draw in the perceiver. Relations may be sustained or come and go, be short or long-lived, deep or shallow. The character of these relations will, will reflect the diversity, particularity, and freedom inherent to so many of our aesthetic experiences, both as theorized and on the ground. 
Just what makes up any relationship, its parts and how it unfolds, will also be relevant to understanding its contours. There could be individual to individual relationships, such as a person contemplating the fragrance of wild mint or the rosemary that I saw planted uh, outside the Founders Hall. Or say community to place relationships, as in farmers' relationships to the land which they cultivate together. Let me also clarify my understanding of aesthetic value. So I'm still kind of on preamble here. When aesthetic, value, uh, when aesthetic value, worth, or good is placed on something, this will depend upon the conditions of the, percep uh, of the, per uh, of the perception, uh, of perception, situation, um, of the appreciator. Uh, this is illustrated, I would say, by uh, a broad range uh, of what philosophers call aesthetic experience. Uh, for example, and here I love lists, and here's, here's uh, a list of uh, aesthetic experiences. Tending to a garden, hiking up a mountain, swimming in a lake, planting a field, beholding a cathedral, choosing something to wear for a night out, preparing dinner, watching a film, creating a sculpture, reading a poem, composing music, and so on. In this respect, my approach, my aesthetic approach, also follows the pluralism inherent in philosophical approaches which explore everyday and environmental contexts, not only the arts. I also acknowledge that in a pluralistic and relational approach, uh, appreciators and creators come to any aesthetic experience or creative practice uh, with their particular values, beliefs, background, heritages, and are situated within particular appreciative contexts and communities. So on to place-based relationships. There is much literature on the concept of place, with some of the most influential work coming from cultural geography. Key points from this work we learn are, first, places are not merely described through their physical geography. They're also constructed through human city, human nature, human rural interactions, and others. As such, social, political, and economic conditions shape the relationships which exist in them. Secondly, places are dynamic. They change, evolve, and are more like processes than static or unchanging entities. Places are spaces with meaning and have histories and narratives. Thirdly, some relationships and narratives are not necessarily desirable. Some narratives may be intentionally kept alive, while others will be critiqued or consigned to the past. A critical approach necessitates a dynamic concept of place and one that is not susceptible to problematic kinds of nostalgia or romanticizing. As environmental philosophers give recognition, more recognition at least, to place narratives in discussions of conservation, place-based relationships have garnered more attention. Post-capitalist aesthetics articulates values through temporal and particular lived relations, and in this way it aligns with narrative-based or new pragmatic approaches to environmental ethics that we find in uh, uh, environmental pragmatism, as it's called. Environmental philosophers O'Neill, Holland, and Light argue effectively that environmental and cultural meanings and values are irreplaceable. These values are constitutive because they contribute to human flourishing and may ground forms of ecological concern. The meanings and values of a place are dependent upon the kinds of relationships and particular interactions which happen there across time. Why? Although not every person will form attachments to where they live or visit, in many cases a person's identity is wrapped up in a place and in its dynamic character. It's this, uh, this entanglement of identity and place from which values and meanings emerge and the constitutive value that contributes to human um, flourishing. Okay, on to post-pastoralism. Within a rural context, post Post-capitalist aesthetics is also, I argue, post-pastoral, which is to say that it critiques the historical category of the pastoral and its contemporary expressions by contesting romantic characterizations of countryside or rurality and revealing the complexities of socio-natures within rural settings. So it critiques romantic characterizations and reveals complexities of socio-natures within rural settings. The post-pastoral rejects the pastoral because it cannot capture the relational and ecological aesthetic perspective due to anthropocentric and privatized framings of place. 
So pastoralism defines literary styles, some of which uh, began in ancient history, while post-pastoralism defines an approach in contemporary eco-criticism. The pastoral style can be found in 18th and 19th century European enthusiasm for the aesthetic category of the picturesque. Uh, also in the popular poems of Wordsworth, to a point, uh, the works of Henry David Thoreau, also to a point, the music of uh, so-called pastoral symphonies, and the visual arts. Interpreted as a landscape aesthetic category, pastoral suggests the gentle beauty of fields, streams, and small woodlands, exemplified by many of the rural landscapes found in Europe and North America. Anti-pastoral critics have argued that it romanticizes and idealizes rural life because living in the so-called rural idyll often means a life of economic hardship and grueling labor. In response to the ways in which pastoralism distorts and sentiment sentimentalizes rural life, the eco-critic Terry Gifford proposes post-pastoralism, that's his term, which adopts a critical approach to understanding the particular meanings, qualities, and lived experiences of rural places. And also how these experiences are represented in literature and in the arts. In the context of reading literature, Gifford sets out various features of post-pastoralism, and here they are. So, quote, awe leading to humility in the face of the creative destructive forces of nature, awareness of the culturally loaded language we use about the country, accepting responsibility for our relationship with nature and its dilemmas, recognition that the ex exploitation of nature is often accompanied by the exploitation of the less powerful people who work with it, visit it or less obviously depend upon its resources." End quote. Gifford suggests that the post-pastoral can be brought into a range of contexts, not only eco-criticism. A contemporary post-pastoral account of the aesthetic values of rural landscapes situates them with egal within egalitarian, relational, and ecological frameworks, as I would uh, argue. In this vein, post-capitalist aesthetics resist the assumption that rural beauty is only for wealthy landowners, out of reach for people working in the land, and embraces a democracy of aesthetic values across socioeconomic classes and class boundaries. That both marvelous and dreary aesthetic moments occur in working contexts, as well as during times of leisure or breaks from farming work, is a central feature of the post-pastoral approach. As I see it, the inequalities of labor across the world do not preclude meaningful aesthetic relationships between people and the land. Included here are farmers, workers who enable estates, I'm thinking in the UK context or in Scotland, enable estates to function and thrive. People enjoying the beauty of national parks as well, and seasonal residents. And the aesthetic values emerging from these contexts will be as diverse as the people and their particular relationships to the land and depend upon the situations of appreciators and their human nature communities. Such values range from visual and scenic to more deeply multisensory, environmental, and place-based, to all kinds of other ways in which emotions, imagination, knowledge, and so on shape our aesthetic judgments of beauty, dreariness, awe, wonder, and all the other kinds of values and disvalues we might talk about. Pluralism is built into the concept of the post-pastoral as it seeks to uncover, also, the range of practices through which immersed aesthetic engagement occurs, from farming practices to land art. Although visual and scenic values play a significant uh, part in how many people enjoy the countryside, lack of biodiversity is often hidden by aesthetic expressions of green pasture lands stretching far into the distance dotted by sheep. George Mombio remarks on the sheep-wrecked, that's his term, sheep-wrecked, places of many upland landscapes in the UK, in which, quote, sheep rapidly deplete nutritious and palatable plants, leaving behind a remarkably impoverished flora, little beside moss, moorgrass, and tormentil in many places, end quote. When only surface beauty is perceived in landscapes, there may be the false assumption that beauty goes hand in hand with ecosystem health. Much beauty hides dysfunctional human nature relationships and non-ecological flourishing. Furthermore, such perceptions can also support the false assumption that sheep or hill farming is as idyllic as the expression of beauty perceived in the land. Far from it. 
Here, post-pastoralism disrupts aestheticization and encourages contextualized attention to how aesthetic qualities are present, valued, or disvalued within human nature livelihoods. OK, on to socio-natures and commoning. I'll be starting with commoning. When the concept of commoning is understood as a practice of performance, it can enrich post-capitalist aesthetics by creating a space for collective relations with more than humans in both daily encounters and extraordinary moments. Rather than being concerned only with scenic values and visual qualities, an aesthetic approach supported by commoning connects to social movements which support circular economies, grassroots transitions, and the need for social and environment, environmental limits on continuing increasing consumption. As many would have it, market economies drive constant and unsustainable material growth, a source of many environmental problems. I agree with critics of growth who argue generally that there should be social and environmental limits on continuing increasing uh, uh, consumption. And in this regard, then, I actually use post-capitalist in a weaker sense than it's often used. That is, I'm simply um, thinking of post-capitalist as a kind of market skeptical approach. Uh, so I don't, I'm not uh, equating uh, post-capitalists, say, with degrowth movements. Um, uh, so this market skeptical uh, post-capitalist approach, as I put it, um, uh, is critical of some of the ways um, in which aesthetics is implica implicated in commodification. So post-capitalist aesthetics uh, kind of begins in this way of thinking about aesthetics as implicated in commodification. Um, Capitalist aesthetics, well, what is that? Uh, well, um, as I see it, we could argue that capitalist aesthetics is implicated when aesthetic values support uh, environmental and other injustices. For example, as we find in many of the manicured green lawns, which consume vast amounts of water and are dependent upon harmful pesticides. Well, I obviously also recognize uh, the importance of um, whole industry around um, supporting those lawns, and these are not simple uh, problems to, to unpack. Although sensory aesthetic qualities are a central part of aesthetic experiences and judgments of value, capitalist aesthetics has a tendency to settle on shallow appearances and take a stance to the world which aestheticizes and commodifies rather than uh, finding meaningful inherent values. So the commons approach presents a kind of alternative to neoliberal individualism by working against privatization of land and toward, a communi and toward community ownership. As we find in practices such as reclaiming um, brownfield or post-industrial sites, uh, as we also find in urban gardens and allotments and community uh, ownership of land um, or uh, islands, in, in fact, in the case of Scotland. Recent work on commoning theorizes it as an activity which is performed through community actions that are situated within socio-natural understandings of place. As the human geographer and political ecologist Andrea Nightingale puts it, quote, commons are a site for coming together of the creative energies of humans and more than humans that foster affective socio-nature relations and subjectivities of being in common with others, end quote. In this respect, the commons is not conceived of as a resource or a physical place, uh, as I suppose in the tragedy of the commons it would be, um, but rather understood through a relational ontology. Nightingale writes, quote, a set of more than human contingent relations in the making that result in collective practices of production, exchange, and living with the world, end quote. The socio-natural understanding that is brought to commoning reveals place-based place relationships and entanglements between people and nature within a, 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 a range of settings, from urban natures to rural land to wilder, sparsely populated places. I think it's important to emphasize this range, since it can be argued that the practice, say, of rewilding, um, which we see uh, quite a lot of your quite a lot in the UK and Europe um, more recently and, and uh, certainly here too in ecological restoration and the uh, restoration of um, in, uh, species and so on. Um, so it can be argued that the practice of rewilding may reproduce forms of historical enclosure in places like the Lake District in England or indeed in Scotland uh, as well. People are situated within ecologies rather than as separate from or over and above them. 
the idea of socio-natures grounds a non-anthropocentric conception of relationality and points to everyday interactions and mutual shaping of each part of human nature relationships. So the aim of this first part of the presentation has been to develop a new theoretical approach and show the potential of a critical relational pluralist aesthetics for post-capitalist transitions. Post-capitalist aesthetics has the advantage of filling a gap too, I think, in philosophical environmental aesthetics literature by offering a model that is more sensitive to socioeconomic and political concerns. So in part two, post-capitalist aesthetics uh, will be brought into conversation with land art to explore the extent to which some, some artworks in rural, rural situations support socio-natural relationships of commoning and resistance. Okay, so on to part two. Uh, So at least since the 1960s, artists, art critics, art theorists have discussed land art, which I take uh, as an umbrella term for earth, ecological, and environmental art. Motivated by increasing environmental concern, climate change, and new trends in the art world, land art has received increasing attention, as evidenced by new art practices, major exhibitions, and academic research. Land art is best known for being site specific and in the land, place, or environment itself that is outdoors and often, uh, often within more rural, set, uh, natural settings, pardon me, rather than in galleries or museums. Although sculptors and other artists use natural materials all the time, land artists often use nature as material, subject, and setting. Alongside new land art movements, ecologically informed art histories and theories explore non-anthropocentric art making practices. The significance of place and the local is also wrapped up in this, and how artists and nature co-create through relational and interactive activities. So, well now I'm just gonna go on to collaborative art making. So how should we conceive of the role of the arts in co-creating solidarity and community-based actions with the land, especially given the way in which I've been trying to sketch out a post-capitalist aesthetics? Grant Kester's concept of dialogical art or dialogical practice provides an especially relevant starting point. The concept describes collaborative and collective modes of artistic production, which embody sustained interactions and the sharing of labor. This approach presumes the capacity of art and aesthetic experience to, quote, transform our perceptions of difference and to open space for forms of knowledge that challenge cognitive, social, and political conventions, end quote. In contrast to artistic practices which center on the creation and viewing of art objects, the dialogical practice engages dialogical processes and participatory methods with the artwork taking shape through collective actions which may or may not involve physical, object, uh, uh, physical objects. It is used in a range of artistic practices from socially engaged artworks within urban communities to many ecologically informed uh, practices classified under land art. So I'm going to explore post-capitalist aesthetics uh, through three cases of artworks which adopt a dialogical method and embody forms of socio-natural care and resistance in the countryside, or something like the country. Uh, first, I'll be looking at uh, Patricia Johansson's Ellis Creek Water Recycling uh, Facility, 2001-2005, up in Petaluma. Secondly, Colin, Collins and Goto Studios' Future Forest, The Blackwood of Rannoch, 2013-2017 in Scotland. And thirdly, a more recent work, uh, Jorge Mena Barreto's Voicescapes of the Landless, uh, uh, which is uh, located in Brazil uh, from 2022. The ordering of the cases is intentional and chronological. I'm gonna begin with Johansson, an artist who emerged in the early period of land art and whose work continues today with new commissions. In contrast to the more sparsely populated rural areas of the other two artworks, Ellis Creek is situated at the edge of Petaluma, a small city, 
and serves communities in both the city and rural Sonoma County. Although Collins and Goto have also been working as artists for some time, Future Forest presents an alternative ecological context and, and rural setting in Scotland. Their work stands out for creating solidarity between the differing perspectives of scientists and participants living in the village of Kinloch Rannoch, as well as raising questions of intergenerational justice. The third case, Voicecapes of the Landless, offers a global and planetary perspective through Mena Barreto's concern for food and security and the rights of the rural landless in Brazil. The artist is also influenced by a dialogical process, and his practice provides a very recent reference point in the history of art. Okay, so starting with um, Patricia Johansson's work, Ellis uh, Creek Water Recycling Facility. Johansson has been among the first women land artists to practice ecological art and develop collaborative works, which are now described as dialogical, let us say, as artworks that are also civic projects, engaging local governments, ecologists, engineers, and the public. The aim is to recover and remediate ecologies through a creative process. Sculptural forms, landscape design, colors, and the creation of beauty work in tandem with ecological and technological knowledge to enable significant outcomes which support harmonious human nature relationships. Johansson is interested in restoring places that bring people and nature together, rather than projects that would seek to exclude people in the name of preserving some remote wild area or citing the work in a remote place. Okay. So, an aerial view of Ellis Creek Water Treatment Facility. Um, uh, you can see the uh, water treatment here. I don't know how well my, well my pointer is working. <laughs> Over on the bottom, and then the wetland area at the top. Artistic and aesthetic qualities create interest and bring people together in Petaluma, Petaluma Wetlands Park, which is part of the Ellis Creek Water Recycling Facility site. The 272-acre site recycles water through treatment wetlands, which remove pollutants and provide water for irrigation, support water conservation, and protect wetland ecologies. The work begins from a perspective that is deeply socio-natural, in which uh, her work and, and uh, what we have here, the result, in which the creative remediative, uh, remediative uh, activity is characterized by ecological invitation and humility. And I quote, uh, she writes, the most important aspect of my art is in the parts I do not design. Johansson writes that the project creates, quote, a diversity of ecosystems, uh, uh, tidal sloughs, brackish, marsh, mudflats, riparian corridor, and uplands combined with positive human interventions, colon, agricultural fields, freshwater pine, uh, ponds, and stormwater purification, end quote. According to the Petaluma Wetlands Alliance, new habitats now support over 200 species of birds, fish, amphibians, insects, and plants. Aesthetic experience is integrated through natural and design qualities and can be experienced through four miles of walking trails through the site. Um, through all of its hair, mostly through the top there. Uh, aerial views, as you see here, show how Johansson used the salt marsh harvest mouse, a local endangered species, to inspire the forms of the marsh. And I guess that would have been here. <laughs> Johansson was commissioned by the city of Petaluma and worked as part of the Corolla engineering, uh, engineer's design team. Walking on part of the site while trying to uncover the sense of place motivated her suggestion to the city to purchase an adjoining area, a tidal mud flat which could become functional as a polishing wetland. Ellis Creek is deeply inclusive of people in nature, as shown by its diverse benefits, which range from water provision for agriculture, vineyards, parks, golf courses, recreation, conservation, and environmental education. The collaborative effort to design an imaginative alternative to resource extraction and provision shows a form of resistance which supports actions to address water and food insecurity. Wetlands are historically places associated with the non-pretty. 
Resistance to a pastoral approach is evident in the design's combination of technology and wetland, which create a more holistic ecological beauty in contrast to scenic views, although there are certainly some there too. Furthermore, the site is notable for its continuing role in supporting socio-natural commoning in which multiple agents, water, plants, animals, people, technology, create common wealth. The creative venture of conserving water resources through recycling while also integrating a wetland park meets diverse human needs and non-human needs and generates solidarity in this way. That solidarity continues through the wetlands as a focal point for ongoing community conservation efforts and environmental education for school children. Although the city of Petaluma owns the site, Johansson's creative process clearly shows how, quote, mobilizing around the common are productive moments that build communities, group identity, shared understandings, and repertories of tactics. And that's actually um, uh, uh, from an article by uh, Chatterton, Featherstone, and Routledge uh, about the commons. Looking into the future, there are plans to expand the facility's capacity for water recycling and provision given, given recent historic drought conditions here in California. Okay, so, uh, and that's a, a lovely uh, pie-billed grebe. This is from the Petland uh, what, um, Wetlands Alliance, uh, Petaluma Wetlands Alliance website, but that's a nice little uh, pie build greed on a nest in the in the marsh, and uh, somebody doing some work there. Okay, so big change now to Scotland, <laughs> and uh, and the Highlands for that matter. Okay, so future forest, the Black Wood of Rannoch. The Collins and Goto Studio is a research-led, socially engaged art practice. The artist's methodology involves collaboration with, quote, a range of disciplines, communities, and other living things. It's from their uh, uh, website. Inspired by Grant Kester's work, they explore how, quote, art and imagination contribute to practical wisdom and democratic discourse about ethics and human values, end quote, and work mainly with, quote, natural public places and everyday experience of environmental commons, end quote. Their recent projects are principally guided by an ecosystemic approach to collaborative art making in which the process unfolds through dialogue, human nature interactions, and relational and empath empath empathetic understandings of the, of the natural world. And empathy features very strongly in their recent work. The artists describe Future Forest as a, quote, sustained creative inquiry into the ecological and cultural meanings and values associated with the Blackwood of Rannoch in Highland Perthshire. The history, end quote, the history of land art includes many works with trees which provided historical context for the artists. For example, the Harrison Studios Serpentine Lattice, an installation of drawing, maps, text, audio, and visual elements which present a plan for Reclamation of the Pacific Northwest Temperate Coastal Rainforest, an old uh, growth forest in the United States. Their interest in trees, combined with methods of dialogical art and social sculpture, inspired um, Collins and Goto to embark on the project. As a site-oriented work, they began with coming to know Blackwood's, uh, the Black Wood through repeated visits, as well as the use of video and time-lapse uh, photography. Caledonian pine forests are uncommon, and they are fragmented in Scotland, sadly. Uh, and we also find that there are many ancient Scot pines within these Caledonian pine forests. Uh, and so Caledonian pine forests have, have really special biodiversity value. The Blackwood is 1,100 hectare woodland adjacent to the village of Kinloch Rannoch in Perthshire, and is especially notable for its ecological uh, health and diversity, as well as several Granny pines, as they call them, granny pines, which are two or three hundred years old, these old pines. I'm not sure if that's a granny pine, but that's a gunner's tree. Uh, collaborations were initiated by uh, contacting environmental and social scientists at Forest Research, which, if you're from the UK, you know this is the research arm of the Forestry Commission and were developed with various project partners, including participant, participants from Rannoch and Tummel uh, Tourist Association, Rannoch Paths Group, Perth and Kinshar 
Countryside Trust, and Perth and Kinross Council. Collins and Goto's creative inquiry involved interdisciplinary research uh, and archive work, along with partners, coupled with residencies and a penultimate workshop, which, quote, created a space for participants to reflect on their, uh, quote, uh, on their own current experiences of the forest and imagine alternative futures that protect the ecological value of the forest while exploring a more robust cultural relationship, end quote. So here you see uh, one gathering, at least. Through these methods, they sought to create art with a forest, and that's how they put it, to create art with a forest rather than in a forest. And uh, I was uh, part of one of the workshops, which was a pleasure that me wearing those wellies <laughs> there. <laughs> very different, uh, a very, very different kind of a habitat to, <laughs> to hear. Beginning from aesthetic, historical, and ecological knowledge, Collins and Goto sought to understand the forest as a place of ecological and cultural interplay. Their interdisciplinary interests shaped discussions and a workshop which included ecologists, forest managers, the local community, and relevant local governments and NGOs. This activity, coupled with walks through the forest, provided an opportunity to build solidarities for the sake of the black wood and its human ecological community. And here we are on one of those walks. Solidari solidarities are not without their rhythms of conflict and harmony. And certainly, Collins and Goto have a lot of experience of this um, through their various projects over the years. Their practice embraces, quote, conflict as a tool, as they put it. It became clear early on that there were tensions between protecting the forest and discouraging people from exploring it and the community's own desire for more access to the forest. A non-anthropocentric conception of intergener intergenerational justice was a driving for, uh, force of Future Forest, hence the title, Future Forest, with uh, Collins and Goto's interest in the place generating temporal concerns. With the area's history of Jacobite rebellions, landed estates, highland clearances, and enclosures, they learned how the Rannoch Valley had been a site of political and social conflict. This history is deeply entwined in the ecology and evolution of the forest, with overgrazing and enclosure for deer hunting shaping some of the aesthetic qualities of the place. As conveyed by one of the community participants, they write, it is important to remember that the solitude and silence today is very recent. In the history, the black wood was full of humans as they were felling trees, grazing animals. It must have been a rather noisy place. We have to honor the past, but remember it honestly." End quote. Later, owned by the Forestry Commission, thousands of trees were harvested until the black wood became a forest nature preserve and site of special scientific interest, two important uh, conservation designations in the UK, and that was in 1974. The artists wanted to better understand conservation and community concerns into the future, with the ultimate aim being the protection and potential expansion of the black wood. Another community participant, participant commented, quote, can you imagine Rannoch in 100 years with both sides of the loch covered in Caledonian pine? So Kinloch Rannoch um, adjoins Loch Rannoch, which is a very long uh, lake up in the highlands. So they're imagining, um, uh, Caledon Forest on both sides of the loch. What is the common wealth, wealth produced through creative inquiry here? It's deeply intergenerational in character, with many concerns coming together to imagine collective futures. As the workshop unfolded, participants considered the social values associated with the black wood, and a set of recommendations were produced which considered ways to integrate cultural activities, such as a network of paths, but also supporting biodiversity values. The artist produced a video artwork, uh, which you can find online. It's called The Forest is Moving. And, and then that uh, phrase in Gaelic, which I will not attempt to say, <laughs> which ultimately asks, quote, what might it take to deliver a future black wood that takes more than a day to walk through and repays time and attention with special experience and knowledge that fires the cultural imagination for generations to come. A later collaborative video work, uh, quote, Decoy, The Passage of Time in a Caledonian Pine Forest, 
brings to life the history of the forest and its human nature entanglements. So both of those uh, works you can find on the uh, website of the Collins and Goto Studio. Both the artworks uh, and multisensory in situ explorations reveal aesthetic experience as embedded in cultural ecology with an immersive environmental aesthetics leading to the discovery of values in this forest's birds, insects, trees, plants, mosses, deer, geologies, atmospheres, and seasonal change. Okay, on to the final example. Jorge Mena Barreto is a Brazilian land artist and professor of art, I think he's actually up in Santa Cruz now, who creates site-specific works which engage with the consequences of global food production. His most well-known work to date is Restauro. So I think I'm gonna skip what I was gonna say about Restauro and just move straight on to Voicecapes of the Landless. But I encourage you to um, look up, if you're interested in this, in this work that I'm gonna talk about, uh, look up Restauro, because it's a really interesting uh, a work that's uh, been um, a kind of performance work that's been presented in different um, different uh, exhibitions, including the Sao Paulo Biennial. Uh, so my focus here is actually more recent work, and so there's not a lot written about it. Um, I was fortunate enough to correspond with um, the artist, and and uh, I have some images from the work. So Forescapes of the Landless combines the methods of um, oral history, sound recordings, and video with dialogical and collaborative land art practices. Rather than recovering the, the cultural ecology of the forest, as we saw in Future Forest, Voicecapes collaborates with people and nature to create multi-species voicecapes by recording agroforestry workers. Mena Barreto worked with the artist and photographer Pedro Leal, to generate not only sound recordings, but also photos and interviews from meetings with workers. The farmers are part of, and I do not speak Portuguese, so I'm gonna do my best here. The farmers are part of the Movimento dos Trabalhadores uh, Rurais Sem Terra, or the Movement of Landless Rural Workers, or MST, which is a well-known long-standing long -standing social movement in Brazil, which has made a significant impact on land reform uh, through land occupation of landed estates, or what are called lenti, uh, uh, lati fundios. So Voicecapes captures uh, rural ecologies and the solidarities that have formed there, as the voices are, quote, embedded in the soundscapes of the food forests they cultivate, end quote. The work so far has been cited in Terra Vista, in the municipality of Arataka in Bahia. The Terra Vista settlement illustrates how the MST, this, uh, land rights movement, not only works for land rights by challenging agribusiness and the state's policies on land use, but also points up the interdependent cultural and ecological values of rural places to unsettle the urban-rural hierarchy. There's one image uh, interviewing a community member. And then another image of recording in the forest. In addition to the photographs from the artwork that I've shown, on the artist's website you can watch and listen, and I recommend that you do it, um, to a 10-minute video soundscape. Uh, I didn't want to try to do a sound clip because it is, after all, uh, a sound work, <laughs> very dependent on sound. Uh, so I mean, I'm only showing you visual images. Um, but it is 10 minutes long, and you really li need to listen from start to end to do it proper justice. But the video begins with a live image of lush forest plants recorded from a distance of a few meters from the camera. We hear mostly wild birds singing and calling, but closer oral, A-U-R-A-L, attention brings to the surface a bottom layer of higher-pitched insects like a continuo in music. Every now and then, the call of a red jungle fowl, an introduced and domesticated species, punctuates the soundscape. From time to time, a person's steps are heard coming and going as they walk upon a soil or gravel surface. As the video progresses, we hear the sounds of passing cars and trucks in the distance and other unidentified anthropogenic sounds. The camera pulls back, the, anthrop the anthropogenic sounds increase, and the forest becomes framed on each side of a 
uh, sort of rustic looking doorway. At this point, what was recorded as a seemingly natural environment becomes one of cultural and ecological interplay. As I interpret the artwork, the aesthetic experience underlines the values of the rural. Uh, the, the forest is not pristine and uninhabited. Rather, it is a place of human nature interaction and production. The work embodies a multi-species and multi-sensory collaborative approach, which nicely illustrates relational aesthetics. In the video, there are no human voices or stories of struggle, but we do hear the forest and its various human and non-human residents. Both forest and sound provide alternatives to features of the pastoral fields and scenic views, respectively. Hearing, uh, hearing rather than seeing enlarges the scope for aesthetically knowing the forest, too. In other work on the project, uh, he writes, quote, stories of struggle and resistance of the settlers are narrated along with soundscapes in which the voices of the forest and the sounds of cultivation are mixed, end quote. There are plans to bring the recordings into Terra Vista's schools for learning purposes, placing forms of political and ecological resistance front and center. I would say that voice, VoiceScapes taps into aesthetic meanings and values and supports a creative resource for building both rural communities and alternatives to industrial farming. OK, so I'm just going to conclude now. I have just about one more page. I hope that's OK. Um, so this is just an overview of the conclusion. So post-capitalist aesthetics and planetary commoning. So through dialogical art, uh, which engages the global concerns of resources and the landless, Mendebreta's practice connects to new conceptions of the commons as planetary. Writing the context of climate justice, Chatterton, Featherstone, and Routledge argue that the common, or the commons, apologies, sorry for the, <laughs> planetary communing sounds pretty cool, but it is actually meant to be commoning there. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, but Chatterton, Featherstone, and Routledge argue that the commons ought to be conceived as, quote, a central demand practice, pra a central demand or practice of translocal political networks rather than as something which is necessarily bounded or particular. So they're arguing for the commons as a kind of translocal and transpatial phenomenon. They envisage commoning as a geopolitical and intergenerational activity which strengthens grassroots movements by connecting them at a planetary scale. Based on my discussion uh, so far, I'd like to suggest a concept of planetary commoning which draws on their idea and also is grounded in this kind of ontology of, so uh, ontology of socio natures and relationality. Also shows concern for non-anthropocentric intergenerational environmental justice. So a lot there, but uh, trying to move toward this more planetary sense of commoning. So what might aesthetics in the arts look like within uh, this notion or idea or practice, however we want to conceive of it, of planetary commoning? Uh, so Nicola Triscott, um, or Triscott uh, she proposes that planetary commons can provide a guide for engaging the arts with wider than local contexts and places. Art practices should, quote, be free to explore a range of ideas, forms, and subjects underpinned by a long-term investigation into the inter interrelationships between planetary imagine imaginaries, political thought, artistic agency, and environmentalism. Certainly, I think there are a lot of uh, ecological, ecological art practices which already do that, but I think she's trying to emphasize this within this kind of new thinking around um, the concept of the planetary. Including ecologies from the Earth's atmosphere to tropical rainforests, for example, um, if we think of these, these different contexts, this can challenge both theory and practice to consider how meaningful aesthetic ethical relations shape planetary care in response to the effects of rapid environmental change and loss. Furthermore, conceiving of the commons at a planetary scale helps to resist the idealization of the local that may be, that may feature, may be a feature of some site-specific artworks while also recognizing the importance of attachments to particular places and their communities. The role of land artists in planetary commoning extends from the value that creativity can bring to generating new solidarities. As Johansson conveys, quote, artists have always changed the way we see. Now we need to change the way we act. Such solidarities may be built through the practice of ecological citizenship, which is a concept taking uh, us back to uh, uh, 
this new, um, well, not so new, maybe model in environmental ethics called environmental pragmatism. Ecological citizenship stresses the positive relationships with the environment, which develop through opportunities to engage with natural processes in urban and rural places. As a political concept, which is developed by the environmental philosopher uh, Andrew Light, who is now has a role in Biden's cabinet, I think. Do you remember, Mark, as a climate advisor? Uh, such citizenship can remediate environmental um, injustices by restoring ecologies, repairing broken human nature relationships, and fostering an inclusive ecological community. Light critiques approaches which seek to preserve wild places and adopts a pluralist environmental ethics. The places where humans and nature meet, and again, the context of the rural, and community gardens and parks, land lying on the urban fringe, have great potential for revealing harms to nature and how challenging it can, can uh, and how challenging, in fact, it can be to restore the damage that's been done um, by humans, largely. Elsewhere, I've argued for how relational and pluralist uh, uh, intergenerational eco-aesthetics can support ecological citizenship. So this critical approach uh, taken in, in these socially engaged art practices is uh, certainly paramount for preserving the value of creativity and collective imagining. And again, kind of bringing it back to the socially engaged practices and building community relations, uh, uh, Julie Crawshaw and Menelaos and Xartios, uh, in the context of art within rural practice, uh, development practices write, quote, we don't see art as a panacea to community tension. Instead, we argue that art has the capacity to reveal community relations, end quote. The case studies discussed here uh, show how creative processes themselves, quote, reveal community relations in their exploration of aesthetic, cultural, and ecological dimensions of place. I think they also illustrate something like the aesthetic principles of post-capitalist aesthetics, placing the artist's valuable skills at the center of opening up dialogue as, and this is uh, uh, Tim Collins from the Collins Goto Studio, opening up dialogue as, quote, an independent citizen professional. This is how you might see yourself, uh, see themselves. An independent citizen professional, a generalist with training in the techniques and concepts of creative inquiry, social systems interaction, and discursive democracy. So I think, again, to close, in these ways, various dimensions of the aesthetic perspective can work together to config, uh, reconfigure or configure planetary commonwealth. So, thank you.